Where did sorcerers get their tattoos? Maybe I didn't know anything anymore. I drove home thinking about that watch your back. I was already watching my back and Pat knew it. Was he warning me to watch my back against SOF? Was a loyal if part blood member of SOF warning me that SOF itself was not to be trusted? Okay, lately I'd heard about part bloods needing to stick together for mutual defense. And I'd heard a long time ago about the goddess of pain and I knew none of our SOFs liked her. But I thought, I assumed, this was only because she was a hard-ass bitch who was more concerned with her own career path than with making humanity safe from the others. Was Pat suggesting something more ominous? And if he was, was he suggesting it about one overambitious Gorgon with skewed priorities? Or about a treacherous vein, you should forgive the term, running through all of SOF? Gods and angels wasn't bow enough. At a stoplight, I flipped open the glove compartment and looked at the clutter. A few of the charms twitched. Poor mom. At least she was trying. I realized that I was grateful for the useless tangle, even if it was useless, because she was doing something. She hadn't averted her eyes from the fact that I needed help. She merely had no clue how much help or what kind. Only Khan really knew. Only he didn't know because he wasn't human, so he didn't know what he knew, or something. When I got home, I sat staring at the shadows the leaves from the trees threw on the driveway. They glinted and did strange things with perspective, like all shadows did now. But they were beautiful and they didn't mean anything. They were what happened when light fell on leaves. It wasn't late summer anymore. It was autumn and the leaves were beginning to turn. A pale yellow one, like a big flat blanched almond, skittered across the head of the rack. I opened my knapsack and swept the patch of charms into it, including one spark plug, quite a lot of string, and a few rubber bands from back in the days when the glove compartment performed the usual function. I was pretty sure I felt a tiny penetrating buzz when my skin connected with one of the charms, but I had no idea which one, then I went and knocked on Yolandi's front door. She opened it almost at once. <clears throat> Come in, she said. I have spoken to my old master. I sighed. I followed her in. She took me to a room I had not been in before, next to the kitchen, also overlooking the garden. I knew at once that not many people came here, first because, if she wished no one to know that she had been a wards keeper, or at least to believe she was a retired wards keeper, this room would give the show away. <laughs> Second, because the privateness of it radiated from everything in it, like heat or light. I brushed one hand across my face as if it was a veil I had difficulty breathing through. She noticed this and said, oh, pardon, and lifted something down from over the door we'd come in. The sense of private space invaded, lessened, sank like water. I looked down, bemused. The shadows on the floor were very active. She laid the things she had moved down on the desk. I sat in the chair in front of it. I leaned forward, held a hand over it. Something beat at my palm. It wasn't heat any more than my dark vision had to do with my eyes, but it was perhaps related to heat, and it manifested itself a bit like heat against the skin. I moved my hand and looked at the thing. It was a tiny round piece of what looked like stained glass. I could see the leading of it, but I could not see if the fragments made up a picture or if any of the bits were painted. The shadows swam in it very strangely. Wards Keeper. It sounded so solid. Even if you blew up the occasional workshop, at least you were in training. And for what? Your master told you what to do, what to do next. 
Yolanda, you're watching my face said, I'm sorry, my dear. I know this is one of the last things you want to hear, but I think you are in over your head and exactly what you are best suited to be in over your head in. My grandma grows confused, and you are doing very well. She was getting almost as bad as Khan. What happened to random chat? I wanted to say all I wanted was to bake cinnamon rolls for the rest of my life. But I knew it wasn't true, and besides, I was tired of whining. So I didn't say it. I picked up my knapsack out of the seething knot wetness still roaming about the floor and set it on her desk. As I lifted it, I, I, I had felt the charm thatch inside it scrambling to stay away from the knot wetness. As I set it down, it seemed to be trying to escape contact with the top of the desk. Well, I thought, I guess at least one of them is live. Her eyes widened and then she frowned. Lift it up again if you would, she said. I did and she took something out of the drawer and spread it out and then gestured for me to put the knapsack on it. I did. Whatever was going on subsided. What have you brought me to look at, she said. I opened the knapsack but had a sudden reluctance to touch the charms. Wait, she said, and brought something else out of another drawer. A pair of wooden tongs. They had symbols scrawled up their flat sides. I groped around, grasped an end of the tangle, and hauled it out. It seemed to have half unraveled itself. It came out looking like crochet gone very, very wrong. As it came free of the knapsack, one end snaked around as if seeking something, and then began climbing up one arm of the tongs toward my hand. Drop it, said Yolandi sharply. I dropped. It landed on the desk. There was a hiss and a bad smell, a really bad smell, and then there was a little forlorn, and then there was a forlorn little heap of bad crochet work, plus one spark plug with a torn out hole in it, edged by a purpley brown stain. The stain writhed, Ugh, I said. Ugh, indeed, Yolandi said mildly. That was no ward. That was a fetch. Where was it? In the, in my car, I said. Do you keep your car locked? Not here, I said, cold needling up my spine. No, she said. If whatever had placed this had come here, I would have known it. Then it, they, someone, something can get into a locked car, I said. The coldness continuing to climb. Something, I thought. No, wait. Vampires didn't do fetches, did they? Where did these other items come from? Oh, since I was missing those two days, my mother has taken the buying charms for me. They're supposed to be wards. It occurred to me to ask you if any of them was, um, live. Have you no wards on your car at all? Only standard issue, the axles, the steering wheel. Every car manufacturer in the world has a ward sign worked into its logo, and every car company in the world stamped the center of its steering wheels with its logo. I did have the door locks warded by the guy who sold it to me, but I guess it didn't work. I scowled. Oh well. Dave had never claimed to be a ward specialist. He only promised the wreck would run. And the car is 15 years old. They hadn't invented the alloy yet. Which enabled car manufacturers to ward almost everything. There was a big difference in used car prices pre and post alloy. Some of us, including Mel, Dave, and me, thought that the alloy was the latest vehicular version of those skin creams that guarantee no wrinkles, those diet plans that guarantee a figure like this year's reigning vid star in 30 days. Lately, the commercial labs were working on a ward that would dissolve in paint like salt and water and make every painted surface warded too. When they got it, there would be a huge advertising campaign, but it wouldn't be that useful really, like salt water. If you needed to melt some triffids, it was great, but there hadn't been a triffid outbreak in generations. If you had mouth ulcers or a sore throat, you were better off with a loom or aspirin. If you had vampires, the paint on your car might give them a few friction burns, but it wasn't going to stop them breaking the windscreen and dragging you out. Your best traveling ward, unfortunately, was still the motion of traveling itself. I didn't like it that Yolandi wasn't saying the usual things about the warding power of motion, not to worry, etc., etc. Well, but we just proved there was something to worry about. That fetch sure hadn't been undone by riding around in a car. 
Yolande had picked up something that looked a lot like a knitting needle. It even had a tiny hook on the end and was poking at the mess of crochet. There was one pale blue bead that still had a bit of glimmer to it. I think some of these were live quite recently, she said. I think what they have warded is the usefulness, uh, the usefulness of the fetch, which has worn them out. You don't have any idea where you acquired it, I don't suppose. How long have you been stuffing charms into the glove compartment, I said absently. A fetch was usually roughly the shape of the thing to be fetched. Something that was trying to find or fetch a person was often a sort of elongated star shape with a bead or a crystal or a chip at its center for the heart and smaller beads or crystals or chips for the head, hands, and feet. I was sure I would have noticed my mother giving me a fetch, and besides, she wasn't that stupid. Eight years with my dad had made her less easy to fool than most ordinary people about anything to do with magic, and she was constitutionally hard to fool about anything anyway. When had I noticed that the clutter, including eight or a dozen loose charms in the glove compartment, had turned into a matted snarl? I'd opened it when to look at a map. I'd been sitting in the driver's seat. Several things had plopped out onto the floor. I'd heard them rustling around the way charms will, and still looking at my map, I groped around on the floor for them. I picked up one or two, but I could still hear the rustling. They were creeping across the floor under the passenger seat, humping themselves over the drive shaft, and one or two of them had made it under the driver's seat, which was fast moving for charms. I still hadn't paid a lot of attention. I'd scavenged around under the driver's seat and pulled out anything that squirmed and shoved the whole lot back into the glove compartment without looking at any of it. But if there'd been a fetch under the driver's seat, then the wards would have mobbed and then tried to disable it. That had been a day or two or three after I'd taken that inconclusive ride to No Town with Pat and Jesse. Watch your back, Pat had said. SLF, I said in disbelief. No, and what I wished was disbelief, and a belief that made me feel like I'd been dropped down an elevator shaft into icy water. Someone in SOF did this to me, in SOF, and whoever it was wasn't going to like it at all, but it hadn't worked. No genuinely innocent member of the human public should be able to denature a fetch. My dear, said Yolande, large organizations are inevitably corrupt. The more powerful the organization, the more dangerous the corruption. When I was young, I wanted to belong to one of the big Warcraft cor corporations. Zanet or Drusilla, if I proved skillful enough. Several of my master's apprentices went to such places, and he was always gloomy and preoccupied for weeks, months after he'd lost one of us. That was always how he'd describe it, that he'd lost Benedict, he'd lost Ancilla. I was lucky. I was a slow learner. By the time I was ready to choose how I would pursue my vocation, I was ready to stay where I was and go on working with my master. There were only three of us for many years, Chrysogon, Hippolyte, and myself, other than our master and a few apprentices who came and went. Note, I thought, the next time I meet someone with a really strange name, ask them if they're a wards keeper. It is still better that SOF exists than it not exists. One must also earn a living. There is no equivalent in the SOF world for my master's small group of Lord's Keepers. She was right there. The Sentinel Guild are pretty sad, and the Vindicators are worse. The SOF feller, fel, fellow who came here once, he is your friend. Pat, I said, is he? He is not perfect, she said, but nor am I, nor are you, nor is your dark companion. But yes, he is your friend. He wishes the defeat of the evil of the dark, as do we all. Depends, I thought, on what you mean by the evil of the dark, or maybe by we. Pat is not only interested in, in what you can do for SOF or for his career. Don't forget my cinnamon rolls, which make strong men weak and strong women run from the bus station in high heels over our cobblestones to get to Charlie's in time. If you know all that, can you tell me who planted the fetch? 
No, I'm afraid not. I know about Pat because he sat in one place waiting for you for 20 minutes once. And that place happens to lie under the limit of one of my more ambitious warnings, and it went on taking er notes as long as he sat there. <coughs> I doubted <coughs> I could persuade the goddess to come sit quietly under the oak at the end of Yolandi's drive for 20 minutes. I told you I had spoken to my master about you. I also spoke to Cressagon. We believe we can create something for you, but it would be better, stronger, if... You want blood, I said resignedly. Most wardcrafters made do of something like a dirty apron, which I was sure was what my mother had been using. A few of the more determined or well-established ones will ask for hair or fingernail clippings, but there is an enormous black market in things like hair and fingernail clippings, and the more you're likely to want to charm, the less safe you're going to feel passing out bits of yourself. Blood's the worst. Not only is it blood, which is by far the most powerful bit you can hand over for all sorts of purposes, but any concept that contains magic and blood together makes the majority of the human population think vampires and freak out. This is actually totally stupid since vampires aren't interested in teeny wardcrafter vials of blood and a vampire that wipes out a wardcrafter's shop isn't going to Jones for you because they've had this tiny hit like an ice cream stand, flavor of the month sample, and cross continents till they've found you and had the rest of you. But the paranoia behind the general principle is valid. Yes, said Yolandi. <clears throat> I'd never met a wards keeper, though, let alone had one do up a personalized ward for me. And as concepts go, one that contains Yolandi and Black Market is going to disintegrate on contact. So that should be fine, right? Except I have this thing about blood, and Khan's little healing number on me hadn't helped it. Um, I said... Yolandi was smiling. You may close your eyes, she said. Okay. If you would hold out your hands, palm up, and extend both forefingers, and then I am going to prick the center of your forehead. The chain round my neck had begun to warm up before I closed my eyes, and I could feel a gentle warmth against both legs as well. Oh, gods, guys, I said to my talismans, isn't this way below your dignity? I flinched at the sting in my forehead, but the fingers were easy even for me. I touched the warm chain with one hand and fished in my pocket with the other. Maybe you can translate something else for me. I found this at the bottom of a crumbly box of old books at a garage sale. Well, how extraordinary. This is a, a straight way, very clear and plain. Clean and old, very untainted for a ward so old. It represents the forces of day, of daylight. The sun itself is at the top, then an animal, then a tree. Interesting. The animal is a deer, I think. Usually it is a fierce creature. A lion is the most common. This is not only a deer, it has no antlers, and is therefore perhaps a doe. And then round it, round the edge of the seal, do you see the thin wavy line? That is water. With these things you can resist the forces of darkness, or they cannot defeat you. Of course, this is only a ward. The peanut butter sandwich you throw over your shoulder at the ogre, I said. So maybe you'll make it over the fence if he stops to eat it. But this found you. That is important. The forces of day is not a very uncommon war. But this is simply and exquisitely done, and it found you. Keep it near you and keep it safe. My heart lifts that this thing found you. It is good news. Don't tell me how much I need some good news, I thought. When do you think your own ward will be... Ready. Soon, please. Please ask your dark ally to wait till it is ready. It will not be more than a day or two. Back to the bad news. Yolandi and her wards keeper friends thought Khan and I were going to face Bo that soon. Well, I suppose I thought so, too. Later, upstairs, the balcony door opened, candles burning. I sat cross-legged, hands on knees. I wasn't going anywhere. I just wanted a word. How soon? Not tonight, not next night, then. No sooner. Yolandi, Ward, me. 
It was going to take a lot of work before this alignment business replaced the telephone, but I wouldn't be around to see it since it looked like I had two days to live. And I'd been complaining about waiting. So what do you do when you know you have two days to live? Wait a minute, hadn't I been here before? No. I was only pretending last time. I hadn't known that I was sure Khan would save me last time till this time when I knew he wouldn't. But I'd been here before. I was still finding out I had more stuff to lose by losing it. And I already knew I thought this was a triple carcinogenic. Carthaginian hell of a system. So where was I, right? What you do when you know you have two, two days to live. Not a lot different than if you didn't know. Six months you could do something with. Two days, hmm, eat an entire bitter chocolate death all by yourself. Actually, I bombed on this. Mel had to eat the last slab. A pan of bitter chocolate death isn't very large, but it is intense. Reread your favorite novel, the one you only let yourself read anymore when you're sick in bed. I might have enjoyed this more since I'm never sick, if death didn't seem like a very bad trade-off. Buy eight dozen roses from the best florist in town, the super expensive ones, the ones that smell like roses rather than merely looking like them, and put them all over your apartment. I bought five dozen red and three dozen white. I have one vase and one iced tea pitcher, which has regularly spent more of its time holding cut flowers than iced tea. After I use these and the two twinkly gold fleck tumblers and two cheap champagne, champagne flutes, plus the best of my limited and motley collection of water and wine glasses, I emptied out my shampoo bottle, which was tall and rather in nice shape, even if it was plastic, into a jam jar and put a few in it. I cut most of the rest of them off at the base of the flower and floated them in whatever else I had that would hold water, including the bathtub. I decided this had been one of my better ideas. The last three, two red, one white, I tied together and hung upside down from the rearview mirror of the wreck, better than fuzzy dice. Take a good long look at everyone you love, everyone local, you've only got two days. And don't tell anybody. You don't need to be surrounded by a lot of depressed people. You're already depressed enough for everybody. Of course, in my case, I couldn't tell anybody because either they wouldn't believe me or they'd try to stop me. I thought about being rude to Mr. Cagney. It was something I'd been longing to do for years, and I... Somehow managed to be behind the counter on the second morning when he needed someone to complain to. But I looked at his scrunched up, petulant face and decided rather regretfully that I had better things to do with my last morning on earth. So I said, mm-hmm, a few times, refilled his coffee cup, which he changed tack to tell me was cold. Okay, I'm not merry, but it was not cold, and left him to Charlie, who didn't know it was my last morning on earth and was hastening over from cranking down the awning to stop me from being rude. Other things I didn't do included waste any time trying to find out who planted that fetch on me. Yolandi did a sweep on the wreck for me and didn't find anything but two new wards tucked under the front bumper and a ticker behind the rear license plate. She was quite taken with the wards, saying she was falling behind on research faster than she knew that they were a whole new design of traveling war and by far the most effective she'd seen. They had to be SOF too, an example of a large corrupt organization getting it right. She left all of them alone. I had been hoping to see Pat. I could promise anything he liked for tomorrow or the day after that, but he didn't show up as he mostly hadn't been showing up since the night we blew out HQ. He must be getting his cinnamon roll fixed by White Bakery Bag. In a world where I was less and less sure of anything, I was sure that that Jones was real. I was sorry not to have a chance to say goodbye, except of course I wouldn't have said goodbye. When Mary came into the bakery to ask if there was anything hot out of the oven she didn't know about to tell Jesse and Theo, I said carelessly, oh, I'll bring it, I'll try my new whatever these are on them. I liked the idea of inventing a new recipe on my last day on earth, and I've always liked to see my guinea pigs' faces when they first bite down. 
I said, so say hi to Pat for me, and they both looked at me as if there was a hidden message, which there was, although I doubted they were going to guess it. They were distracted quickly enough by the whatever these were. I'd have to do the unthinkable and write out the recipe so Polly could have it, and maybe Emil would come up with a good name. Sunshine's Eschatology, hey my Eschatology, would have butter, heavy cream, pecans, and three kinds of chocolate in it. I'd miss feeding my SOFs. They were good eaters. I'd miss being alive. I had been due to work through the early supper split shift, but I decided I wanted to see the sunset from my balcony once more, so I wheedled Emmy into it. Didn't want her to lose all her bakery skills just because she'd been made assistant cook next door. Polly was going to need her. I'd already bent Polly's arm into a pretzel till he'd agreed to take the dawn shift tomorrow. The Thursday morning system had broken down so completely, I no longer remembered if I owed him some 4 a.m.s or he owed me some. The confusion was probably good for him. He was about to have to learn to be chief baker real fast. There were some people and it was too difficult to say goodbye to, so I didn't try. Mom, of course, if I'd made a point of going into the office to say goodbye to her that day. However casually, she'd have been calling the cops in the hospital before I got the words out of my mouth. Once a mother, always a mother, and I'd have to have some spectacular reason for breaking the awkward but practical truce that we never spoke to each other unless on specific coffee house business. Kenny was bussing tables. We exchanged haze. I'd never said goodbye to Kenny, and this wasn't the time to start. I had seen Billy for about two-thirds of a second earlier in the afternoon when he blasted into Charlie's long enough to fling over his shoulder at the nearest parent the information that he was spending the rest of the day with the equally hyperactive friend accompanying him. He did not acknowledge me. I was part of the family backdrop. What was to acknowledge? My importance lay in the availability of the eight muffins and two each from every bin and four if they were chocolate cookies they took with them as they blasted out. Again, Mary and Kyoko, I said see you two. I waved to Emmy, who was in the main kitchen looking harassed, but I was beginning to suspect that her harassed look was covering up the fact that she was having a really good time and didn't quite believe her luck. I always checked out with Charlie to make sure there weren't any last-minute gaps I might be able to fill to make sure our schedules for tomorrow matched. I told him about the swap with Polly. I only said I was tired, and I knew I, and I, know I looked it. We didn't say goodbye either. Our ritual went, see you tomorrow, sunshine, and yeah. I said yeah, as usual. Even on days off, he said, see you tomorrow, because even on days off, he usually did. I hadn't realized that I never said goodbye to anyone about anything. Mel, he was on break when I left, and he wasn't jiving with some guy or guys in greasy denim about overhead cam shifts for hot pastrami or meatloaf sandwiches, or for that matter discussing world news with one of our more coherent derelicts. Mel was leaning against the corner of the building drinking coffee and muttering to himself, I knew what he was muttering about. He'd given up smoking ten years ago, but he still wanted a cigarette every time he drank coffee, and he drank a lot of coffee. Sometimes his fingers twitched, not from the caffeine jag, but from the memory of doing his own roll-ups. This made him drink more coffee. One day he was going to wake up and discover he'd turned into a coffee plantation, and then Charlie's would have its own fresh homegrown beans, even if we had to replace our chief cook. There are worse things to wake up and discover you've turned into. A vampire, for example. Although the books say you'll know it's coming. Mel looked up and saw me, and his face eased into his good old boy smile. Mel used his charm as deliberately as laying an ace on the table, so you could see exactly what it was. It was one of the good things about him. Whatever he might not be telling you, what he did tell you was the truth. I'm your friend, sunshine. He still looked like someone who should be wearing greasy denims rather than an apron, although the tattoos confused the issue. Greasy denims and a long hooded cloak. Hmm. I wondered if sorcerers ever used food splotches instead of cosmetics. 
Hey sunshine. Hey. We still on for Friday afternoon? I nodded, probably too vigorously, because his smile faded. Something wrong? Nothing that wasn't wrong the last time you asked me that question, I thought, only it's got longer faster than maybe I was expecting. I shook my head, trying to be less vigorous. No, thanks. He swallowed the last of his coffee, put the mug down on the floor, and came over to me. Sure. Sure, yeah. I put my arms around him, leaned my face against his shoulder, my forehead against the oak tree that was visible beneath the torn off sleeve of his t-shirt and sighed. He smelled the food in daylight. I could feel his heart beating. He put his arms around me, probably just lingering indigestion from eleven twelfths of a bitter chocolate death yesterday, I said. I felt the small kick of his diaphragm as he laughed. He had a sort of furry chuckle laugh, but he knew me too well. Try again, sunshine, he said. Do blue wells are thee guzzling all that seawater? Your veins run chocolate, climb a stark semi-sweet, not blood. Pity it looked red then. It gave vampires ideas. I didn't say anything. You can tell me about it on Friday, okay, he said. I nodded, okay. If I said any more, I would probably burst into tears. I drove home slowly. I thought of going by the library, but decided the meal came into the too difficult category, and she might conceivably make some kind of guess what I was feeling so gloomy about, and I didn't want to take the risk. What a really awful reason not to see someone for the last time, but I was so tired. I sat in the car again at home and watched the leaves turning. It seemed to me a lot of autumn had happened in the last two days. I thought of the two days out of time I'd had after Con had diagnosed me and before he was supposed to come back and cure me. I'd known I was dying, but it kind of hadn't mattered. It wasn't only that I believed Con would find a way to heal me. It was that there wasn't anything I could do. I didn't have that luxury this time. I was going to have to go through with it, whatever it was. I'd always scorn the stories where the princesses hung around waiting to be rescued. Sleeping beauty, spare me, tell the stupid little wuss to wake up and sort out the wicked fairy herself. I found myself thinking that sleeping through it sounded pretty good after all. Yolandi was looking out for me and her door was open before I climbed out of the wreck. I walked draggingly up to her. I didn't even know that it was going to be tonight. I remembered those extra nights I'd waited for Khan, with death lying on my breast like a lover. What a long time ago that seemed. I tried to make this a hopeful thought, but it refused to work. It was like trying to blow up a popped balloon. Hello, death. You again. Just can't keep away, can you? Saints and damnation. Mostly damnation. Yolandi drew me into her workroom. There was a little heap of sunlight on her desk. What? I blinked. It looked like as if there was a chink in the blind letting a single ray in to make a pool there. Except it wasn't a pool, it was a heap, and there was no ray of sun. I could feel my eyes fizzing back and forth like a camera's automatic lens, trying to find the, re the right setting and failing. The heap cast no shadows, it was a small down tummock of pure golden light. I had stopped the stare and Yolandi went to her desk and picked it up. It seemed to flow over her hands slowly like rivulets of warm honey or small friendly sleepy snakes. It was, I thought, as it separated itself over her fingers, a lattice work of some variety. The filaments met and parted in some kind of pattern. And the filaments themselves seemed to carry a pattern like scales on a snake's back. It moved slowly, but it moved. It curled round Yolandi's wrist. My strange sense of it, them, being friendly but half asleep, remained. It will wake up when it touches you, she said, as in freeing my mind. We had to put it together in great haste, and it's not yet used to being manifest. She came toward me, stretching the light net gently between her hands like a cat's cradle and threw it over me. For a moment I was surrounded by twinkling lights, and then I felt it, them, settling gently against my skin, delicate as snowflakes, but warm. 
Bemusedly, I held one arm out to watch the process. You know how if you watch, if you concentrate, you can feel when snowflakes land on you, feel, feel the chill of them, almost individually at first, till your face or hand or arm begins to numb with the cold, and then they melt against your skin and disappear. So it was with these tiny light flakes. I saw them as they floated down, shimmering down, felt them when they touched me, lighter than feathers or gossamer, and over all of me. Our clothes were insubstantial to them, but they were not merely warm. A few of them were uncomfortably hot and left tiny pinprick red marks, and while they dissolved on contact like snowflakes, they appeared to sink through the surface of my skin, leaving nothing behind, no dampness, no stickiness, no shed scales. After they'd all vanished, if I turned my arm sharply back and forth, I could just see the webwork of light, like veins, only golden, not blue. I itched faintly, especially where belt and bra straps rubbed. Yolandi let out a long, slow breath. I looked at her inquiringly. I wasn't sure it was going to work. I told you we had put this we had to put this together very quickly. What is it? Yolandi paused. I'm not sure how to explain it to you. It is not a ward, or only indirectly so. It is a form of come hither. But generally only sorcerers ever use anything like it. It it gathers your strength to you. It taps into the source of your strength more strongly than you can unaided. Most magic handlers have a talent for one thing or another, and it is drawn from one area of this world or another. A foreseer with a principal rapport with trees may see visions in a burl of her favorite wood, for example, rather than in the traditional crystal ball. A sorcerer whose strongest relationship is with water will be much likelier to drown his or her enemy than to meet them in battle, although one with an affinity for metal would forge a sword. Affinity, I said bitterly, my affinity is for vampires. No, said Yolandi, why do you say that? Pat, SOF, that's why they want me, because I'm a magic handler. I could hardly get the phrase out. Handling seemed far from the correct term in my case, with an affinity for vampires. Yolandi shook her head. The hierarchies of magic handling are no particular study of mine, but your principal affinity is for sunlight, your element as it were. It is usually one of the standard four, earth, air, water, fire. Sometimes it is metal, sometimes wood. I have never heard of one for sunlight before, but there are our tests for these things. Yours is n neither fire nor air, but a bit of both and something else. While I was doing the test and coming up nowhere, I thought of sunlight because of all the days I have seen you lying in the sun like a cat or a dog. I have only ever seen you truly relaxed like that, lying motionless in sunlight. And you told me once about the year you were ill when you lived in a basement flat and how you cured yourself by lying in front of the sunny windows when you moved upstairs. I thought of your nickname, how I myself had relied on your nickname to tell me the real truth about you after the vampire visited you. As for your, let us call it counter affinity, your counter affinity may be for vampires. I have never heard of this either, but I do know it is often a magic handler with a principal affinity for water who can cross a desert most easily. A handler with a principal affinity for air who can hold her breath the longest. Someone with an affinity for earth who flies most easily. It is the strength of the element in you that makes you more able to resist and simultaneously embrace its opposite. You are not consumed by the dark because you are full of light. I didn't feel full of light. I felt full of stomach acid and cold phlegm. I knew about the four elements, of course. I even knew a little about this counter-affinity thing. Magic handlers with a principal fire element never get hired by the fire service. Fires tend to be harder to put out with them around. But an air or a water is a shoe-in for the fire core because airs never seem to suffer smoke inhalation. 
and water seams. To go further with the water. A lot of lives have been saved by the airs and the waters and the fire core. I've never thought of it as having to do with counter affinities though. But then I had never thought a lot about magic handling. I had always been too busy being fascinated by stories of the others. I can see in the darker now, I said, not wanting to get into how it happened. But it makes me kind of nuts. In the dark, it's okay, but I see in through the shadows and daylight, too. But I see through them, strangely. I mostly can't make sense of what I'm seeing. Or if I can, I don't know if I'm imagining it to make it make sense. And most of them wiggle. Yolandi looked interested. Perhaps she will tell me more about that sometime. I may be able to help. Sometime, I thought, yeah. The shadows on you don't wiggle, though. They just lie there like all shadows used to. Ah. That will perhaps be the purification process of Lord's keeping. If you become a master, as I eventually did, you go for a series of trials that are to make you what you are as intensely as possible. You would not be able to do what a master does without this. I, I imagine you will see other masters of their craft as you see me. I still hadn't decided if the shadows that fell on Khan moved around or not. Dark shadows were different from light shadows, so to speak. If they didn't, did that make him a master vampire? What is a master vampire? SOF used the term for someone who ran a gang. I held both arms out and admired the faint twinkly gold, felt the faint prickly itch. I pulled a handful of my hair forward where I could look at it, and it too was laced and daubed with gold. Maybe Alondi could sell the process to a hairdresser. Bet you didn't have to touch it up every few weeks. Pity. I wouldn't be around to demonstrate. The sun was near setting. I dropped my arms. Thank you, I said. That is so feeble, but thank you very much. You're very welcome, my dear, says Yolandi. I must go now, I think. Yes, but I hope you will come back and tell me about it. I met her eyes and saw with a shock that she did know. I tried to smile. I hope I will, too. I sat just inside the open doors of the balcony, cross-legged, hands on knees, I didn't bother to try to align, to ask him anything, to tell him anything. He would be here soon enough. He would be here. This time what was doomed to happen wasn't going to be put off. It would begin tonight, and probably end there too. The sun reddened the autumn colors on the trees. The shadows darkened and lengthened. <laughs>